Welcome, symbol lovers, to another edition of Understanding the Symbols of Hieronymus Bosch. And we're still looking at the temptation of St. Anthony. And these are the outside panels, and these are the inside panels. And this time we're going to decode the symbols directly behind St. Anthony, the ones he's turning his back on. And we'll do that because we know that the center panel captures the moment when St. Anthony realizes that the heretics have been right all along. St. Anthony is here receiving awareness that uh, world history has been different from what he has understood it to mean, but now he understands it clearly, and now he's seeing things as they really are, and he's seeing the most well, the most important issue in his life and in the life of Hieronymus Bosch is being played out in a vision behind him. And that's the vision uh, we want to examine this time around. In the last video, I identified the man ushering in the dragons over there on the left as Paul, and he's bringing in the false teachings. And you'll notice that that little cluster of symbols is separate from our central cluster of symbols with the musicians and the man offering the cup. That is, the incidents with Paul have happened at a different time. This isn't all exactly one and the same thing. It's just Paul is part of this procession, but he's also not part of this procession because they happen at two different points in time. But Paul comes first. We will be using the five keys for understanding the symbols of Hieronymus Bosch. And the first one we're going to use is, it's exactly what it looks like. And so our question is, what does it look like? Well, our central cluster of symbols here is we have four creatures two musicians, a caterer offering a toad and a large egg on a silver platter, and we have a very spooky creature in the background blowing some smoke through his long nose. And we have a very robust man, and he's standing next to a beautiful woman. She is shimmering white, and he is in he is not in armor, but he is in festive dress, and he is offering the four, uh, let's call them musicians, on the other side of the table, a golden cup. So in exchange for the toad with the egg, he is offering the four a golden cup. And we see the owl of Hieronymus Bosch staring at us, telling us this is all very important and to sort this out. And that's what we'll do. And we'll do that by looking at the outside panel. The outside panels tell us what was on the minds and in the heart of Hieronymus Bosch and St. Anthony of Padua. And that is the behavior of the church. And so when we look at the outside panels, we clearly have a monk executing people. And in the right-hand panel, we have monks cooperating with the state who are about to kill people. And this has been painted in contrast to the life of Jesus. So what has happened? How did these so-called followers of Jesus turn into persecutors. What was the pivotal event that changed the persecuted followers of Jesus into the persecuting church of Jesus? Well, that pivotal event is what's depicted on the inside. So this is exactly what it looks like. And what it looks like is a wedding. It looks like we have a bride and groom here, except this seems to be a magical wedding. And since we know there's no such thing as magic, these must all just be symbols that we need to interpret. Notice that the egg is over everyone's head. 
An egg is a symbol of metamorphosis. Things start out as goo, but then they magically transform into new creations. So an egg is a symbol of metamorphosis. The toad is, of course, the symbol for the false teachings of the false prophet and the dragon. So the false teachings of Paul on the subject of metamorphosis are being offered up and exchanged for gold. That makes the four weird musicians the four Gospels. That is, we have the oldest Gospel, that old man whose ending seems to be chopped off, just like his foot is chopped off at the end, and that would be the Gospel of Mark, the oldest one. Next to Mark, there's a man with a pig face. This is the Gospel of Luke. Luke was a Gentile, so he has got a pig face. Sometimes a pig represents someone dirty, low, so forth, but it can also simply mean that someone was not Jewish. They were solid Gentiles, and that's what that means. That's the Gospel of Luke, and the big guy holding up the platter is the expanded Gospel of Matthew. We know that the original Gospel of Matthew did not have any of the miracles of birth, but there was a fattened Greek Gospel of Matthew that added all that, and it's the biggest of all the Gospels. And so there it is, the most prominent, offering up uh, the lies of metamorphosis put forth by Paul the false prophet. And the fourth Mysterian is the Gospel of John. He's blowing smoke and looking weird because he's a Gnostic Gospel. So if these are the four Gospels, then who is the woman and who is the man getting married? Well, the woman, you can see that she's otherworldly. She's in that shimmering white. She is the Bride of Christ, and on the table there's the Pearl of Great Value. Uh, she is being married off to that very real gentleman who is, notice he's as real as Saint Anthony himself in the middle of all this weirdness. He is not a cipher, he is a specific person. This is Constantine the Great. And this is the Council of Nicene. This is the marriage of church and state. And from this point on, the church was empowered, corrupted by the money given by Constantine and the power and the favor given by Constantine. From this point on, they joined the state and felt emboldened to be persecutors of everyone who stood in the way of their holding on to power and their holding on to money. There is a reason that it's called the Roman Catholic Church. It's because the church became Romans. They joined the emperor once the emperor accepted Christianity as defined by the Bible. And the Bible has the lies of the false prophet in it, just as Jesus said would come along. At the same time, the bishops of Rome who put the Bible together also edited out of the book anything that Constantine the Great might find offensive, anything that stood in the way of him running his empire. And so the Bible doesn't contain any prohibitions between against slavery, conquest, uh, pillage, all that other stuff that governments do but instructs everyone to be patient and wait on the kingdom to solve these problems. In the meantime, uh, the powers that be are to be left in place, and the church is to be servants of the powers that be, and the powers that be have agreed to be servants of the church. And so, they enter into an unholy deal, not unlike the deal that the Jews had with the Romans at the time of Jesus. And so the church then used the state to do its dirty work, and the state 
used the religion to control the people. And that's the revelation that Anthony is receiving. He's now seeing the uh, Council of Nicene for what it was, this monstrous, ghostly, unholy event from an Ebionite's point of view, the darkest day in the history of Western civilization was when the Bible was formalized and empowered by the Council of, at Nicene, and that's what changed the persecuted followers of Jesus into the persecuting church. And it was when the church sold their souls for money. Well, I guess they actually sold our souls for money. A few last observations. And under the heading of Notice the Negative, there aren't many more negative images of a clergy than the one of the monk slicing off someone's head. Compare this with every other major or even minor work in the Middle Ages. No one depicts the clergy like Hieronymus Bosch does, and he mocks the clergy over and over. So, in summary, the temptation of Saint Anthony is an Ebionite's view, rather dark view, of history. It is a view of the birth of Christianity and the ensuing tragedy for the world. Uh, that's the negative view of history. But the positive view of history is the garden of earthly delights. This is the Ebionite's hope. And so we still have that dark view of Christianity over there on the right. But the hope is it will be replaced by the glorious, well, new religion of the heretics. I'll describe the secret religion of Hieronymus Bosch in my upcoming book. I'm sure I'll finish it. Um, but in the meantime, I'm happy to uh, have made all these videos. And I'm sure Hieronymus Bosch would be delighted that his anger and contempt for the church can finally be explained and exposed. To be clear, the Ebionites hated Christianity because, for one, they mixed God and money. The Ebionites were communal. Ebionites means poor. They were so obsessed with not mixing God and money. Uh, they accepted only the Hebrew version of Matthew, which means they rejected pretty much the entire New Testament, taking only the Sermon on the Mount as their guide. Uh, and not to mention the fact that they were persecuted out of existence by Christianity. And when I say the Sermon on the Mount, I mean principally they tried to live by the principle of do unto others as you would have done to you. Whereas the Christian church was burning people alive including heretics, which included the Ebionites. So yes, they hated them. They hated them for their religious hypocrisy, for their exchanging uh, treasure on earth for treasure in heaven and so forth. And most importantly, they rejected Paul as an apostate, as the great liar, and as a false prophet. And so, now you have a sixth key for understanding the symbols of Hieronymus Bosch. That is, think like an Ebionite. That means you reject the teachings of Paul, you reject his church, and you do not accept the Bible as the word of God, but with great skepticism because you do not believe in magic. You have to go to the Bible to learn about Jesus, but you also at the same time have to reject large slices of it be, when it deals with magic. And of course, the great corrupting factor is money. Hieronymus Bosch would want you to remember all the witches, homosexuals, Jews, and heretics that died at the hands of these religious hypocrites.